Hi, it's Christina with the Sisyphean Journal. Today's August 13th. I already have um, two anniversaries for today that I'm linking to below. One was a criminal abortion death. Uh, a Pentecostal preacher had decided he was going to open an abortion clinic in the back of his storefront church. And the other is a woman who was lied to and kind of bullied into the unwanted abortion. Um, she was told she had to abort in order to get into an experimental cancer program, which was not true, and she was told her baby was doomed anyway, which she was not. She was, uh, this young woman was badgered into aborting a perfectly healthy baby. So today we are going to look at the kind of fake clinic that the abortion lobby has no problem with. And that is fake clinics where women actually die. Now you're allowed to endanger them if you kill them, but you're not allowed to endanger them by giving them diapers and baby formula. So we have to distinguish between a good kind of fake clinic, which is where fetuses are killed, and that's always okay even if the woman dies, and the bad kind where fetuses don't die and women get diapers and formula and baby clothes. Those are the bad kind of fake clinics. So. Now, her medical clinic in Los Angeles had originally been a clinic, but after Maria Soto died from a safe and legal abortion there, the state shut the place down. But owner Leo Keneally got around his legal problem by just reopening it as his private medical practice. And it was still her medical clinic. And nobody seemed to have a problem with this place being called a clinic when it wasn't a clinic. So into this, comes the unfortunate Donna K. Heim. She was a 20-year-old nursery school teacher. Now she went to this fake clinic on July 28th of 1986 where they evaluated her and determined her to be 19 weeks pregnant. Now I don't know why but she didn't return for the actual abortion until two weeks later, um, August 11th, when she had the laminaria dilators inserted. And by that time she was 21 weeks pregnant. She returned the next day for the procedure accompanied by her sister. Now Donna had told staff that she had asthma and she had noted this on forms when she filled them out. But despite this pre-existing condition, a nurse anesthetist administered general anesthesia using Brevitol and nitrous oxide for the safe and legal abortion that was performed by Dr. Douglas Cannon, who Keneally was allowing to do abortions in his office. Now, Cannon did not perform a proper preoperative examination and he had not done an updated assessment as appropriate for a patient with asthma. Now, shortly after administering drugs, the CRNA had trouble ventilating Donna by mass because she was having spasms in her airway. But Cannon consent continued with the procedure for at least four or five more minutes before he decided to help the CRNA try to restore Donna's breathing. But instead of intubating her or performing CPR or administering appropriate drugs, he performed the Heimlich maneuver, which of course did not work. So he lay her down flat and stuck his fingers down her throat trying to open her airway. And when that didn't work, he performed a tracheotomy to try to open up her airway. And he kept trying to open an airway for a further two minutes before he finally summoned an ambulance. Now Donna's sister, who was in the waiting room, had become alarmed at the intense staff activity that she noticed and she asked somebody about her sister and they reassured her that Donna was just fine. But then the sister saw an ambulance pull up and she stepped outside and saw Donna being loaded into the vehicle. So she followed the ambulance to a nearby hospital and staff there summoned the comatose young woman's parents and Donna died the following day without ever regaining consciousness. So an investigation was sparked and an administrative law judge ruled that Cannon was negligent in continuing with the abortion despite Donna's respiratory distress. And he also found that Cannon often failed to do medical exams, take medical histories, or administer standard tests prior to abortions. He was found to have committed acts of negligence in the care of eight abortion patients. In one case, he had sent a hemorrhaging woman home when she reported to a hospital, staff there called Cannon, who advised him to just discharge the patient with instructions to return to his office in a week or two for a checkup. Fortunately, the doctors at the hospital decided to admit this young woman, 
and during emergency surgery, they discovered that Cannon had so severely damaged her uterus that she needed a hysterectomy, and this young woman was only 19 years old. Deputy Attorney General, General Linda Vogel, who presented the case against Cannon, told the Los Angeles Times, there's nothing esoteric here. What he failed to do are things that are learned in the first year of medical school. The board also faulted Keneally in Donna's death because evidently he had been there and had had opportunities to help to resuscitate Donna, but for some reason didn't. Donna's father told the Sacramento Bee, I honestly thought that within a month or two, the man would be in prison for manslaughter. When you go to the cemetery to visit your daughter, there's no way you can explain that. And this guy's just kicking back and making more money. And Barbara's mother, I'm mean, sorry, Donna's mother, Barbara told the Los Angeles County Daily News, I thought they closed the door so no one else would die. But a month after Donna's fatal abortion, Liliana Cortez, another woman with asthma, also died after an abortion at her medical clinic. This time it had been Keneally performing the abortion and as Cannon did with Donna, he continued with the abortion even after his patient had stopped breathing. And Michelle Thames would die at the fake clinic in 1987 after also being inappropriately resuscitated.